Hi friends, Brittany here, former GMP grade lab trainer and current biotech demonstrator here at Ray Biotech. And we've decided to demonstrate serial dilutions. Serial dilutions are a common laboratory practice, so whatever field you're looking to go into, it's important to master them. Many of our kit technology uses them to provide a calibration curve for the measurements of proteins, antibodies, or phosphorylation events. They can also be used when it's more practical to dilute something such as highly concentrated bacteria in multiple steps instead of just one. In this demo, we're going to be performing a serial dilution. We're going to start with a protein of a known concentration and diluting it in repeated steps so that we end up with a predetermined number of decreasing concentrations. When performing experiments with 9612 plates, most of the time the number that people use to fit the plate is seven dilutions and one undiluted sample or control that people use as a blank. This provides seven measurements on our ruler throughout the desired range of detection while keeping a metric for the amount of signal that the background produces in the absence of any targets. By doing a serial dilution and using the same dilution fold in each step, we save time preparing separate dilutions while covering a wide and even range of concentrations. All right, let's get started. Let me introduce Eric, a real-world Ray Biotech laboratory technician. He's already at work cleaning the bench top to prevent contamination. Right now, Eric is grabbing buffers and new tubes, a concentrated protein and eight new 1.5 microliter microfuge tubes, pipettes and the corresponding pipette tips. And he's maintaining a readable laboratory notebook. Let's get started on the calculations within that notebook. We're going to calculate the buffers, the top concentration, and then our serial dilution. We have a 20x wash buffer that we're going to use for a practice calculation, and our 5x diluent buffer that we use to dilute proteins. To obtain a solution optimized for our experiment, we'll have to dilute them to 1x concentrations. So let's start with our practice solution, the 20x wash buffer. Let's say we need 50 milliliters of a 1x concentrated solution. We're going to use the equation C1V1 equals C2V2, where C1 equals the initial concentration, C2 is the desired concentration, V2 is the final volume, and V1 is the volume that we're going to transfer, and that's what we're solving for. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in our values. C1 is 20x, C2 is 1x, and then V2 is 50 milliliters. Solving for the transfer volume of V1, we get 2.5 milliliters. So what we're going to do is transfer a volume of 2.5 milliliters into deionized water. And to calculate the amount of deionized water, just take that volume from the total, and you'll get the amount of failure volume that you need, which is 47.5 milliliters. This results in a one-part wash buffer and 19 parts deionized water solution. It's a best practice convention to place the larger volume into the container prior to the smaller volume, and this should be a habit that you develop. Now, to determine how much of our 5x diluent buffer we need, we need to make a 1x solution containing 50 total milliliters. Hint, you should end up with a solution that has one part diluent buffer and four parts deionized water. You should have come up with 10 milliliters diluent buffer and 40 milliliters deionized water. Again, placing the deionized water into the tube first and then mixing the stock buffer in. Going back to Eric, preparing that tube, he put in the deionized water first, and now is pipetting in the 5x assay diluent buffer. And remember, it's always an important convention to label the tube with your dilution and concentration factors as well as what's in it. If you share the lab with multiple people, you should put the, your initials on it. And if, you're, if it expires, it's going to be in the fridge for a long time. You should put the date that you're using it in and the expiration date. Now that we have the buffers made up, let's start on that serial dilution. First, we're going to calculate the dilution factor between our concentrated stock protein and the top concentration in our experiment. Our protein is 10,000 picograms per mil, and we want our highest concentration to be 1,000 picograms per mil. This means that to make the first tube, we need a tenfold dilution. Now, we'll have to determine the range of dilutions we want to achieve in this series. Let's say we want these tubes to cover from 1,000 picograms per mil to 1 picogram per mil and we want that coverage to be within seven wells of the range, leaving room for that blanket control at the bottom. To calculate the steps in serial, let's try two different dilution factors, a two-fold and a three-fold. 
Using a step size of 2x would take too many steps to cover our desired range. A step size of 3-fold would give a much more manageable series and fit our 96 well experimental design as we have 7 standards and 1 blank. Our total volume for all of these files is going to be 300 microliters. For the first two, we're going to add 30 microliters of stock protein into 270 microliters of diluent buffer, effectively diluting the protein vial by 10. For the subsequent dilutions, we're going to add 100 microliters of the previous solution into 200 microliters of the next tube, diluting the protein by 3 each time. The calculation we made to come up with those numbers was simple. We just took 300 microliters and divided it by the dilution factor to get 100 parts of protein moving through 200 parts of diluent buffer. So here is your precision prep checklist. This is a series of habits that you should develop with all of your standard curves. First, the appropriate buffer volume should be added with calibrated pipettes. Second, you should ensure a homogeneous mixture of each solution prior to transfer. Third, the tip should be ejected in between all protein vials. This is to avoid residual transfer. You should discard the tip each time to ensure there is no residual concentration from the pipette tip influencing your readings, especially by the time you get to the last two. 1,000 and 1 are a big difference. Ensure not to carry any protein into the blank. We want this blank to remain without protein so we can have that measure of reading of a zero without protein. Now we should have the desired range of protein concentrations for our experiment. You can practice by calculating the concentrations of each of the standards using the formula C1V1 equals C2V2. Be sure to check out our full kit walkthroughs on your journey to becoming a lab wizard. For more tips and sample preparation, specifically for ELISA kits or those that use the Sandwich ELISA platform, be sure to check out our website because we've got a variety of them. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more demos and information on proteomic techniques in biotechnology.